Hi, I'm Mary. And I'm Katie. And this is The Housewife Did It. True crime edition. <laughs> neener, 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 neener. All right, real time true crime first. Buster Murdoch has spoken about his father Alex's murder conviction. He still says he did like a tell all interview with Fox, so I did not watch the whole thing. Did he tell all though? I I don't really know. I got a couple highlights. He told some. He told he may have told all, but I'm sorry. I cannot sit through a tell all on Fox News with Buster Murdoch. <laughs> I can't. Um, so he still says to remember that there are two sides to every story. The police just wanted to find a suspect because the case had so much attention and that there is still so much that we do not know about that night. And on that third point, Buster, you're correct. However, when asked directly if he thinks that the word psychopath is a fair descriptor of his father, he said... I am not prepared to sit here and say that it encompasses him as a whole, but certainly I think that there are characteristics when you look at the manipulation and the lies and the carrying out of those, and I think that that is a fair assessment. He said it just like that? That's the quote, so. It's eloquent. I mean, he probably said it like, that is a fair assessment. But... (laughs) I just feel like it's a really weird dichotomy to be like, he did not kill my family, but he Mm -hmm. is very much capable of it because he is a liar, a manipulator, and a psychopath. Like, you're not helping. Yeah. I also heard today, this is not super interesting, but that Alec Murdoch has now lost his phone privileges in prison for something. He probably called Buster and said, did you just call me a psychopath on Fox News? (laughs) Yeah, and they were like, uh, you can't call people anymore. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> None for you. You lost your chance. Yeah. All right, are you ready to get into this one? Yes. All right, I'm going to... S- no. Yeah, no. So I'm going to start with a content warning that this case is incredibly graphic as a whole, but I will try to spare what I'm able to while still telling the story. <coughs> excuse moi This story is about a sexual sadist, and so if that is not content that you are able to listen to today or ever, please feel free to come back next week or listen to our old episodes for now that are not about sexual sadists. So... When a naked and severely injured woman ran into Darlene Breach's home on March 22nd, 1999, she could not have possibly known how much more horrific the story would be. That woman was Cynthia Vigil, and she would be the last victim and survivor of David Parker Ray and Cindy Hindi. Cynthia- That's a terrible name. Yeah. That is a Dr. Seuss-ass name. Yeah, and I would typically just call her Cindy, but A, because we have a Cynthia happening, and because it's fucking Cindy Hindi, she'll probably be a full first and last name the whole time. <laughs> Look, I've been a, fir- a full first and last name my entire fucking life. Yeah, both of us. But it's not that bad. Yeah. Cindy Hindi. Imagine like, if- her parents hated her. Yeah. Imagine if- your name rhymed with your last name. How much worse it would be. (laughs) So Cynthia Vigil was doing sex work in Albuquerque, New Mexico, when she was picked up in an RV by 57-year-old David Ray and his 37-year-old girlfriend, Cindy Hindi. Shortly after getting in the RV, David Ray shows Cynthia a badge and tells her that he is an undercover cop and that she is now under arrest for solicitation. He then handcuffed her, and after this she was knocked out with chloroform, chained to her seat, and duct tape was placed on her mouth. Which seems like if you're going to use a ruse, like, why did it only last 30 seconds? You could have probably kept her still 
with the police ruse for a little longer. But I guess that's not part of sexual sadism, so. Jump the gun. Ignore me. (laughs) Cynthia woke up chained to a chair inside of a strange room. She heard the click of a tape. Oh, God. She heard the click of a tape recorder, which started playing a recording of David Parker Ray himself. I'm going to read very little of this transcript, but just know that what Cynthia was listening to was so much worse and so much more terrifying because I've cut out the worst parts and it was like six pages of transcript and I've got a half a page here. So I'm going to just start picture. There's a bunch of dot, dot, dots in it. He says, hello there, bitch. Are you comfortable right now? I doubt it. You're disoriented and scared, too, I would imagine. Perfectly normal under the circumstances. For a little while, at least, you need to get your shit together and listen to this tape. Also, Mary, pause me at any time if you need. It is very relevant to your situation. I'm going to tell you in detail why you have been kidnapped, what's going to happen to you, and how long you will be here. I don't know the details of your capture, but this tape is being created July 23rd, 1993 as a general advisory tape for future female captives. Do you have a thought? I was just processing. Okay. Now, you are obviously here against your will because, basically, you've been brought here for us to train and use as a sex slave. Sound kind of far out? Well... I suppose it is to the uninitiated, but we do it all the time. You're going to be kept in a hidden slave room. It is relatively soundproof, escape proof, and is completely stocked with devices and equipment to satisfy our sexual fetishes and deviations. But I will get tired of you eventually. If I killed every bitch that we kidnapped, there'd be bodies strung all over the country. And besides, I don't like killing a girl unless it is absolutely necessary. After we get completely through with you, you're going to be drugged up real heavy with a combination of sodium pentothal and phenobarbital. They are both hypnotic drugs that will make you extremely susceptible to hypnosis, auto-hypnosis, and hypnotic suggestion. You won't remember this place, us, or what has happened to you. I'm sure that you want to survive this experience, and I want you to also. But you are expendable, and it's no big deal to go out and snatch a replacement. It may sound harsh and cold, but if you give us too much trouble, or if you pose any kind of a threat, I won't have any qualms at all about slicing your throat. Like I said before, I don't like killing the girls that we bring here, but occasionally things happen. I've prepared a questionnaire that I fill out with each new captive. Some of the questions are going to be embarrassing, but you should answer them truthfully and completely. Well, I believe I've told you everything that I can. I cannot predict the future, and I cannot predict changes of procedure. End quote. I picked out the parts that, like, explain to us what's happening here. Um, The -hmm. parts where David Ray incriminates himself the parts where david ray single-handedly tells us his crimes and what he has done and will continue to do if not if he's not stopped um there is a lot of like grotesque language that continues in this there are a lot of like gory details in the transcript but essentially what to take away from this is that he does drug these women so It is possible, if not probable, that a lot of them, if they did survive, don't remember this. Um, It is also probable that he has killed people. This is what he indicates. So. Do you think that they, like, really don't remember, like, it at all? Or do you think they just don't remember enough to, like, implicate who did it? 
Mm, I think that it depends. Um, I think obviously Cynthia V. Hill remembers, but she escaped. Like, it would if it were up to David Ray, she would have probably been drugged before she could have left. So, like, mm-hmm. I think we're going to talk about a few other survivor stories, and they do have, like, different experiences. But I do think that it is very possible that there are more survivors than we know about because they simply do not remember. So. That's crazy. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Doesn't he keep them there for, like, days? Mm Mm-hmm. And they just don't remember. Yeah, I mean, I don't exactly know how it works, but he's saying that, like, they hypnotize them, basically. So it's like, yeah, if you could, like, take away someone's memories, like, I don't know. Yeah, that's nuts to me. Mm-hmm. Not, I'm not saying I don't believe it. I yeah. Just, but, like, I can't, like, imagine that. Yeah. So the next time that Cynthia woke up, she was in a living room chained to a bed by her wrists, ankles, and a collar on her neck. At one point, David Ray felt that Cynthia was weak and injured enough that he could unchain her arms and legs, but he left her neck chained. David left the house, but instructed Cindy to stay and keep watch. Cindy Hindi got a phone call and walked... (laughs) (laughs) Okay, maybe she is just Cindy, because we can't laugh every time. And I will laugh every time, because it's (laughs) fucking ridiculous. Cindy got a phone call and walked into a different room, just chit-chatting on the phone. Cynthia realized that Cindy had left the keys to her neck chain on a table in the room. So Cynthia reached her foot out to the table scoots the table towards her, grabbed the keys with her toes, but then she takes a moment to think about what to do next. Instead of just frantically unlocking herself, which I think was smart. So she pushes the table back with her foot to the place that it was originally, thinking if Cindy walks back in, I have the keys now. But I don't want her to, like, immediately know that something's wrong. Mm-hmm. So then she sees an opportunity to unlock herself. But there are multiple keys on this key ring. So while she is, like, trying out different keys, Cindy walks back in the room. Cindy Hindi hit Cynthia over the head with a glass lamp. And it shattered... But Cynthia had so much adrenaline that she just keeps on moving. She keeps trucking. Yeah, girl. She eventually, in the midst of all this, gets the right key and gets the lock open. She reaches over to the mattress where there happens to be an ice pick laying there. And she stabs Cindy with the ice pick. And Cindy goes down. So Cynthia starts calling 911, but in the middle of the call, Cindy manages to get herself back up and ends the call. Still, though, Cynthia manages to run out of the house, naked, bloody, and with a metal collar and other chains still attached to her. She tries to find someone to help her, and finally she finds a nearby home with an unlocked door. She just goes in. Darlene Breach and her husband were sitting inside watching TV when Cynthia ran inside their home and told them that she had been being held captive for three days and had been raped. The homeowners immediately called 911 and the police were able to use this information to then trace Cynthia's original call, the one that Cindy had disconnected, and they traced that first call to the home of David Parker Ray and Cindy Hindi. But when they arrived at the home, the couple was gone. Because, of course, they were. Shortly after, though, an officer stopped an RV that was just circling the neighborhood. And Cindy Hindi and David Ray were in that RV and were immediately arrested. 
the police got search warrants for their home and it was horrifying Mm -hmm. any thoughts so far this like reminds me of a case that i think i want to cover where like a woman um is kidnapped by a couple and she like is hiding things all around their house Mm. and then she escapes and then when she tells the police she they go in and they look for the things that she said she did to prove that she had been there and so i was trying to think if it was the same case but i i know it's not yeah um but yeah it reminds me of that and it's just like it's crazy to me when we listen to these cases and we like hear about like all of these people who have been killed by these serial killers Mm -hmm. and there's like one person who like like the killers like slip up Mm -hmm. just enough that one person can like outsmart them and Mm -hmm. sneak away and and it just like crumbles for them yeah, it's so crazy because this seems, like, so yeah. easy. Like, right. they're literally just, like, traced the call, went to the house, all the evidence is right yeah. there, boom, boom, done. And it's, like, then yeah. why is it taking so long? But it's, like, it's just because yeah. Cynthia V. Hill escaped. Like, the one that I'm thinking of, it was, like, very similar situation where, like, the man had gone to work and he had left the captive woman with his girlfriend. Uh-huh. And then... The girlfriend left for some reason. Hmm, genius. And the woman just walked out the door and, like, went to the police. Yeah. Like, how do you, like, miscalculate so, like, so grossly miscalculate that yeah. you just completely let your captive go, which is, yeah. like, great for everyone mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. But, like, it's just crazy to me that, like, there are so many people that they were so careful with that died for them to get to one person and just completely like not worry about it not care at all yeah yeah so upon searching his home police immediately yeah Upon searching his home, police immediately find the area that Cynthia was being held in at the time of her escape. It was, like, a sunken living room, just, like, in the middle of the house. Uh, All of the windows of the house were covered. There was a mattress in that living room with bloodstains on it, chains surrounding it, and that bloody ice pick laying next to it. They found a bucket that she had been forced to use in lieu of a proper restroom. There was also a human-sized box that resembled a coffin that had restraints on the inside of it. They found, this is in the house, they found an extensive collection of sex toys and tools and equipment and other, like, graphic images and, like, BDSM items like there's actually just like images of sexual acts on the Mm -hmm. wall in the house which is interesting because this is like their home we're not even to like the toy box concept you know they have guests come over yeah i'm like and guests are like well they probably don't have any friends david spending all their time doing this yeah This will keep you busy, I'm sure. David Parker Ray lived and worked... Well, he lived and worked as a park ranger in Elephant Butte State State Park. This was just north of the town Truth or Consequences. I I cannot tell you how many times Truth or Consequences is brought up in a true crime case. Yeah. You never hear about truth or consequences for any other reason. Mm-hmm. David Parker Ray had also worked as a mechanic, including in the U.S. Army, where he was honorably discharged. 
As a worker, David Ray was known to be intelligent and helpful. He was also really well known in the area because he threw really massive parties, especially his Halloween parties. So, yes, he does have friends. But if, it's a, if they're all going to a Halloween party, maybe they're like, okay, this is like weird, but it's Halloween. Yeah, I don't know. From a very young age, David's violent and alcoholic father, who would come in and out of his life sporadically, would leave him with sadomasochistic pornographic magazines. David was also bullied by his peers for being socially awkward, not really much for talking to girls. David Ray was married and divorced four times, and he had two children from those marriages. It is said that when Viagra first hit the market, that David Ray called them to ask if Viagra would help him to achieve an erection without having to hurt anyone. It is hard to say if Viagra people are like, I don't fucking know. They're like, can we tap this guy's phone and or get him? Like, they're like, we Some just help. fucking invented this drug. We yeah. haven't even trial run it. I yeah. don't know. This is above my pay grade. Yeah. It is hard to say if or how this is ver- has been verified. Um, but yeah. if, if true, that's interesting. And concerning. Yes. Cindy Hindi, who is also said to have worked in the state park met David Ray at one of his Halloween parties. She was 20 years younger than him, but they immediately hit it off. Cindy was originally from Seattle and had run away from home when she was only 12 years old because she was being sexually abused by her mother's boyfriend or husband, a stepfather figure in her life. But when she opened up to her mother about the abuse, her mom kicked her out of the house at 12 years old. She then entered the partying and nightlife scene at around 15 and had her first... Where where was she for three years? I don't know. Just out on the street? She was 12 and then she suddenly... Boom. She was 15. Yeah. Listen, my job here is not to give you the most detailed biography of murderers. So... She entered the party and blah, 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 and had her first child at 16. By her early th- by her early 20s, she had three kids. Once her kids had turned, this is I get mixed reports on whether it was like when her first kid had turned about 10 or her last kid had turned Sandy about kids? Yes. Sandy Handy? Yes. So she had three kids by her early 20s, and around the time that one or all of them turned about 10, she gave them to her family members, and she moved away. Not long after Cindy and David met at this party, they moved in together. Within a few months, David introduced Cindy to his fetishes, In some of the documentaries, people said that Cindy also enjoyed rough sex so that this was not a concern for her. So I'm guessing that these, I'm using quotes, fetishes and rough sex things were like um, slowly introduced to her, Mm -hmm. you know? And so she's like, which like in and of itself, sure, no shame, fine, yeah. If if everyone is on par with like the same kind of sex, that is great. No yucking yums here. Yeah, yeah. That's what you need in a relationship is people Mm -hmm. who agree Mm -hmm. on the kind of sex you should be having. Yep. Two people who agree, or more, but all parties agree. The agreement is is all of them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. However, eventually, he began to include Cindy in the kidnappings and tortures of many young women. And alleged murders. (laughs) After searching the inside 
of the home, the police got a warrant and searched the locked cargo trailer outside of the home. Upon entering, there was a sign reading Satan's Den. In the center of the room was a homemade and modified gynecological exam chair. All of these things that I'm going to mention have been modified and I will not tell you in what way. If you just have like the greatest stomach in the world and you have no qualms, you can find this information on Google. But just know they're modified like, to... You... Hmm. Like the chair was homemade and modified? Mm-hmm. Well, like... Like he built it? Mm... Or he modified it himself? Like, I think the modifications are himself, but I mean, it's, like, very modified. Mm -hmm. So, like, everything in this room is modified to inflict as much torture and damage as possible. Yeah, I know. I Yeah, I've seen the yeah. chair. I was just caught up on the handmade part. I was like, did he build the chair? Um. Yeah, I mean, I don't think he, like, built it from scratch, but, like, he homemade the devices on it, is what I'm saying. Like, he homemade... Okay all of the modifications and things because he's a mechanic so he does all of that so around the room were various torture devices some completely handmade and some modified medical equipment some were modified sexual devices law enforcement felt immediately that this was a sexual torture chamber they stated that these items look to be crafted to inflict the maximum amount of pain. And they also found videotapes of captives in the trailer. With They also found videos of David, like David was in the videos, like testing out camera angles and testing out the equipment. Like he would like talk to himself and like basically like take one, like see if the chair works. It seems that they either didn't find tapes with explicitly violent or torturous acts or those were not admissible in court later on um because the videos that are used are like benign like they're just like videos of people there they're not like videos mm -hmm. of people being hurt so i'm not sure if that means like he had hid those or like they did not find those or if that just means they were never brought into court i don't know so when police questioned David Ray about the purpose of what would later be known as the toy box, and this is how David Ray refers to it. This is, I'm not making light of this. Um, he did not deny creating it, which is, you know, smart, because I don't know how you would. But he said that he and Cindy used it themselves and occasionally with a consenting third party. So, <laughs> in addition to the videotapes of the victims, they would find that, they would find that audio tape that was played for Cynthia Vigil. They also found David's journals where he detailed the types of tortures that he inflicted on his victims, including how many times each was tortured and how long they were there. There were dozens of entries, but none of them had any names. David refused to discuss this journal when he was questioned about it, but then police reportedly found throughout the home over 400 items that ended up not belonging to either Cindy or David, presumably the belongings of many victims. Now, I don't know what the verification process is on whether they belong to Cindy and David. I would assume if you come up to me and you're like, whose shit is this in your house? I'm going to be like, it's mine. So I'm like, did Cindy and David just straight up be like, we don't know whose that is. <laughs> when it's like in their house about, f they're bringing four, one item in at a time up to 400. And they're like, nope, not mine. Nope, not mine. They're like, we have so many parties here. People leave stuff all the time. There's literally no telling who that or belongs to. Or one of our consenting third-party people left it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, of course, like it it ha- it says DPR engraved in it, and they're <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah. So, of course, the police search the property for further evidence, including digging in the yard for possible remains. They did not find any on Ray's property. However, they were able to charge him for the kidnapping and rape of Cynthia Vigil. So, no murder charges at the time. Or spoiler, ever. The community that knew David and Cindy so well could not believe it. They were so shocked, in fact, that his job gave him paid leave because they were so sure of his innocence. <laughs> also, he's a fucking Look, park ranger, dude. Like, I will say, a job that defends you that hard. Beautiful. The dream. Yeah. But if one of your employees is accused of something like this yeah i personally would not ride for them also like couldn't you like retro back like if you find out he's innocent you can be like oh we'll pay you for those months you were in prison or you were arrested yeah we're so sorry Whatever. we're we would rather be safe than sorry to the people though right so it's like why is he getting paid for the time that he is sitting in prison or in, in a jail, in a temporary, whatever, in a holding cell. Why? 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 So. You should rather be sorry than safe to the pay, accused yeah. murderers. Yeah, to pay murderers. Yeah. Given the evidence that had been recovered from David and Cindy's home, they f- the police felt sure that there had been other victims and or survivors. They suspected that David had also committed murders because they found a lot of talk of death and killing in his writings and tapes, and he had a lot of drawings of murders lying around, I guess, along with those drawings of sex acts. David lived on a large lake, which he had a lot of maps for inside of his home. He also used a sailboat with depth finding equipment pretty regularly. With his job, David would have had full access to Elephant Butte State Park. So, police were hoping that people who knew something or who had survived David Ray and possibly Cindy Hindi would come forward. And Angelica Montano did. Angie had been friends with Cindy, and she was invited over... Yeah. I could not be friends with someone named Cindy. Cindy, I'd be like, let's get you a nickname for your last name. (laughs) Something else. Cindy, (laughs) Cindy. She was invited over to Ray's house, where she was then kept and tortured by by the couple for four days. This was earlier in 1999, so same year. Although David claims in his audio tape that he will not be softened by any sob stories, and Angie was almost certain that she was going to be killed, David and Cindy were swayed by her talking about her young child back home. So when they had finished their torture with her, They dropped her off on the side of the interstate where she was picked up by an off-duty officer. You might think that this is incredibly lucky. Except... Well, I know she doesn't tell anyone until (laughs) now, so I'm not really (laughs) phased by it. Except that when Angie told him what had happened to her, he did not believe her. He thought that the story was so outlandish that it could not possibly be true. You are bad at your job. I will say this story, like as I tell it, I'm like could not be real. Has to be a movie. Could not be real. Has to be a movie. So like I do get Mm -hmm. that being your inclination. However, yes, not your job as an officer. (laughs) No. If that, if that's your, your go-to, that's the first 
conclusion you arrive at, then you're not doing your job. Also, given what we know David Ray is doing to these women, I cannot imagine Angie Montano was looking in great shape on the side of the interstate. So that's what I keep thinking is like, I do know the modifications Mm -hmm. and the devices that are modified because I've heard this story told by people who are not as delicate. Yeah. Um, And I'm like trying to figure out how Mm -hmm. it's like not obvious what has happened to these Mm -hmm. women. Yeah, and, like, you think of Cynthia V. Hill and you think, like, you would probably have abrasions from being, having your hands and ankles and your neck. Like, you would have marks on your neck. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she was bleeding from places. Like, she's probably disoriented if she's been on drugs. And then that's not even including, like, so many more injuries that she should Mm -hmm. and probably did sustain. So, yeah, it's like, even if you don't believe the depth of her story she's been hurt like she's been injured and you don't want to inquire where she may have been injured right and i also just feel this thought actually just occurred to me that like not that they would have known who it was i guess although angie montano probably could have told them exactly who it was because she Mm -hmm. was friends with them but how do you not just perform a rape kit? Yeah. Like, I assume they were doing that in 1999. Like, just... I don't understand why you would even pick someone up off the side of the road to help them as a police officer. If you're just going to be like... If you're not going to listen to them. hmm And it's just like... That's literally the whole fucking job. Yeah. I also just feel that, again, given the things that this couple is doing, like that a rape kit would be very um what's the word i want it there would Telling. be remarkable findings like right. it, it would not be like oh we're not sure like it's unclear like yeah. it would be very clear so i don't even think you would need to fully no. conduct the rape kit no so um for it to be very clear yeah like how hard would it be to like she's offering you this information Mm -hmm. she wants to get help for it how hard would it be to take her to a doctor to just get the exam done Mm -hmm. i know that takes like money and resources but like Mm -hmm. the worst that can happen is that you rape wasted one one exam it sounds like we get truth and consequences here so In an attempt to find more survivors or information about victims, the police released some images from one of the videos because the woman being held captive in that video had a distinctive tattoo on her leg. Kelly Garrett recognized her own tattoo on the news and she came forward. Kelly, though, did not remember this happening to her. She said that for a while she had been having nightmares of being tied or chained up, but had no idea that they were actually memories. So I guess, like, to answer, and again, like, this is only Kelly's experience. Like, I don't know Mm -hmm. the range of this. But to go back to your question earlier, like, even if people did have, like, any sort of memory, you would Mm -hmm. probably convince yourself that that's not real yeah you know i just can't imagine like being like forced to take so many drugs that i don't remember like four days of time i know like i like i cannot believe that like yeah that kind of like combination exists yeah and like is just like attainable and used like it it like baffles me yeah that that's all they were doing to get them to not remember i know this time period yeah and like also 
I'm like, are David and Cindy like trained hypnotists? Like what else? Right. You know, like, but like how are like, how is it just like the drugs fully hypnotizing them? Mm-hmm. And then like we said, like the, you would have injuries. The injury you would have afterwards. Like, yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, how do you, what would you think those are? Yeah. Yeah. Like, how would you think that happened? Like what, mm-hmm. what would, what would you conclude mm-hmm. if because if you don't remember then there's no logical explanation right. that comes to your mind right it's and like, it, what do you do when it, you see them it's also possible for these girls that don't know david and cindy at all that are like mm-hmm. total stranger abductions it's also possible they do remember what happened to them but they don't remember where mm-hmm. they don't remember who right that's what i was thinking earlier is like maybe they remember the situation but they don't remember the specifics enough to feel confident like reporting it Mm -hmm. i also like it makes me think like you were saying like how much drugs do you have to give someone to forget that much but i had originally thought like surely he's just like intravenously giving them drugs for the whole time they're there right like that's the only way i could think that you would have no memory is when you're like basically not conscious for it anyway however right and this is fully an assumption, but I would assume that a necessary factor in sadomasochism is consciousness, right? Right. And so, like, you would not really want, I would assume, your captives at least to be, like, fully out of it. And the way he talks in the audio tape is, like, you will be given this afterward. So mm-hmm. I just, it's hard to know. Um yeah. But then they also do, like, with Angie, like, abduct people that they know. So maybe those people get more drugs. Like, I think, mm-hmm. and he said, like, there's no there's no way for me to predict changes in protocol. So I think yeah. it's just, like, hard you to know. know. I, keep hmm. I keep thinking of the, like, last couple seasons of Arrested Development mm. where Will Arnett's character is, like, voluntarily taking roofies Mm -hmm. to erase his own memory yeah and he's like taking them daily and he and he's like doing like a groundhog day type thing almost yeah where he like does like he literally has no clue what he's done the day before yeah which like obviously it's like a fictional show yeah obviously but like it just that's what i keep thinking of is like like something that they've concocted Mm -hmm that like not like truly like just wipes everything yeah and i mean i felt far-fetched when i watched it on arrested development and now i'm like i like how do you how do you figure that out i know that's what i was thinking is like i wonder though if like he's been doing this for years at this point many dozens Mm -hmm. of people i wonder if like he tested some concoctions. If at the end the woman remembered it, she died. Like, um, I don't yeah, know. That's but what I was yeah, like I'm sure he had test like run. test runs. Yeah, but yeah. I also think that when you're roofied, you can forget like the lead up. Like a lot of people were like, I don't even mm-hmm. remember going to that bar. So it's like, yeah. I guess if you think of it that way, that if you're roofied, you could forget the beginning of your night, then maybe if you are phenobarbitaled enough, you could forget four whole days. Like, I just, maybe. Yeah. I think, I I think it's, like, the amount of days that's throwing me off. I know. But, like, I know that drugs can do that Mm -hmm. to you, because, like. But it's, like, that has got to be a lot. And I forgot how I got from a restaurant to a bathroom. I still do not remember walking Mm -hmm. from the restaurant to the place where we were going to the restroom Mm -hmm. and like yeah there um yeah there are like several things from like college that i like don't remember very like small snippets of Mm mm-hmm So I think it's, like, the amount of time that's throwing me off. Because I know that, like, you can lose memories. And I know that you can, um, like, 
black things out. It's like the amount it would take for it to last yeah for consecutive days right and you even have to consider like you forgetting your walk to the bathroom yeah it's also like that's irrelevant to you so to think that you forget four days of the most horrific thing that has ever happened to you Mm -hmm. and you have like bodily trauma to think that you like wouldn't and this is not at all like we're saying it's not possible it's just like so crazy that's so yeah. horrifying to think that, like, something like this could happen to you and you yeah. just go on, like, not knowing. Yeah. I had, like, a very intense fear as a teenager that I had some sort of, like, repressed memories mm-hmm. that I just, like, didn't know about. And I, like, I, I told uh, my roommate at the time in college... And she was, like, a psychology major, and she was, like, repressed memories aren't, like, real. Really. Like, they're, it's not, like, what you're thinking. Like, it's not, like, you just, like, one day you'll be, like, oh, my God, this happened to me. Right. And Mm -hmm. I completely forgot about it. She's, like, it's not gonna happen. Um, So, like, it's scary to think that, like, this woman is watching the news and sees her own leg. Mm Mm-hmm. And, like, genuinely is, like, I did not know that happened to me. Yeah. So. Horrifying. Yep. Once Kelly Garrett finds out about this video from David Parker Ray's home, she is actually able to recall and kind of start piecing together memories. She tells the police that one night, July 24th, 1996, she had been downtown in Truth or Consequences at the bars with her friend Jesse Ray who happens to be David Ray's daughter Kelly had been fighting with her husband earlier that night so she decided to just go out drinking but she couldn't drive home so Jesse offered to drive her home but Jesse asked if they could make a stop at her dad's house on the way When they got there, Jesse and David together attacked and put Kelly into the toy box or the cargo trailer out back. It is likely that Jesse had already drugged Kelly's drink at the bar. However, according to David's introductory audio tape, he would also have continued to give her drugs that would cause her to forget what was happening. She remembered being kept there and sexually assaulted for three days. Like, again, like, memories are coming back. Mm -hmm. Before David drove her home in his park ranger's uniform, which happened to resemble a police uniform in the area, and told her family that he had found her. Now, Kelly was kind of visibly injured, but David was a good Samaritan. Mm-hmm. Found her, brought her home, cleaned her up, whatever. Unfortunately, Kelly's husband believed that she had been cheating on him that night, and so he filed her divorce in the same year. So David Ray... A douchebag. Yeah. David Ray ruined this lady's life. Yeah. Along with his daughter. Yeah, now she's out of friend. Yeah. And a husband. Well, but see, this makes and me wonder. several days worth of memories. Is she out of friend? Did she continue to be friends with Jesse? Like, I don't know the answer to this, but, like, would well, she have even known? Is, like, would Jesse, would Jesse continue to hang out with her? Like, what, like, I would think that that would be risky. Mm, maybe. But I almost think, like, like wouldn't that be. she does remember one day. But what if that's more what suspicious? What if she at your face and she's like, shit. Maybe, but it's like, would it be more suspicious that y'all are friends and then you hang out with a bar? Maybe, she, you you gotta be thinking as Jesse. she could remember being with me at the bar. She could remember that she was with me one night and then now all of a sudden I don't talk to her? I don't know. It's hard to say. Maybe. But. Can you imagine being man- being married to a misogynistic man? I can't, no. I truly can't. 
No. Like I hear I hear things like this where like like a woman's attacked and She's her injured. husband like blames her and leaves her. Yeah. And I like truly cannot wrap my head around it. I'm like, my husband would never Like, I don't know Kelly, so I don't know like her history of like getting drunk and being out, you know? Like yeah. just whatever. But like she's got again, we say she has got to not look in great shape. Yeah. And so if, also, she's been gone for three days, not one night. Yeah. So she comes home after three days looking hurt. So if mm-hmm. she has had any any sort of sexual encounters outside of your home, don't you want to, like, inquire a little bit why she has come back injured after three days and probably doesn't remember anything? Unless yeah. she's telling him, I don't remember anything. And he's saying, like, that's obviously not true. That story is so outlandish yeah. that I cannot believe it. That man is bonkers. Yeah. I, like, I like called my husband in, like, the middle of the night, um during his bachelor trip and like interrupted his night to tell him about the shit show that was happening at my bachelorette trip. Uh-huh. And like he It was me. Yeah. He, I like, was the shit he, show. Like, listened. He like checked on you. He was like very concerned. Speaking like, of back roofies. The next day. Yeah, he called me back the next day to like check in on everyone. And like like I can't imagine like it's like I like slightly different, but like I can't yeah. imagine like we called him and Billy mm-hmm. that night. I can't imagine if either of them were like pissed at us for like not that we did anything. Yeah, but like, but, like, if, if, like even pissed at us for like bothering them or like yeah, it just that it's crazy to me that there are men that marry women and then don't care about them. Yeah, it's also like they this guy probably would have been like, why were you in that situation? Why'd you put yourself right. in that situation? Yeah. A douchebag. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to offer you some food for thought. Some some little timeline pieces. So I want to note that in 1996, when Kelly Garrett was kidnapped and tortured by David and Jesse Ray, David Ray had not yet met Cindy. So by the time that David and Cindy are arrested for the kidnapping and rape of Cynthia V. Hill, they had only been living together for less than a year. Like, eight months. Do you think he was fucking his daughter? I do suspect okay. that. Okay. I don't, like... I also suspect that. Yeah, I mean, I don't... Like... I don't know. I don't, like, know that, but, like, clearly there is some incestual relationship going on where they're performing sex yeah. acts together. They're getting the same sort of pleasure from these sex acts and doing them together. I My guess yeah. is that she was his Cindy. She was his, like, main accomplice right. That's before what I Cindy. Say. I think there's, like, a mirroring aspect yes. of his relationship with Jesse and then his relationship with Cindy Hindi. Yes. So, I mean, I don't know if they... If he raped her, if they had mm-hmm. a sexual relationship, but I mean, they have a sexual relationship, period. Like, if they're engaging yeah. in this together. So, that would be my guess, yes. So, after Kelly Garrett came forward, the police went and arrested Jesse Ray. Good. Good work, friends. See, jail. Jail. they're jail. acting so quickly now. <laughs> You're like, yee, mm-hmm. yee, yee. So around this time, the police are getting Cindy to start talking by offering her reduced charges. She said that David sought out sex workers and admitted that she helped him to abduct these women. She confirmed that he has killed others and that she knew of 14. Now keep in mind... Cindy has only been with him for eight months. Mm -hmm. She confirms their suspicions that he uses the state park to bury and hide bodies. 
she even says that David wants. Why do they have suspicions of just because he works there and he has full access to the oh. state park. Um, yeah, and they had said, I don't remember, like, who or in what situation, but someone had said to them once, like, oh, a cop came and talked to me. And they found out it was David Ray, and, like, that's how much his park ranger uniform looked like a police officer's uniform. So, like, I think he kind of just had, like, full reign out there. Okay, that's on the government. Yeah, y'all need to make those a little more distinctive. Cindy even says that David once explained to her that to put a body in water, you should always empty the body cavity so that air doesn't lift the body. After this comment, I don't know either. (laughs) After this comment, divers did attempt to search the lake near his home, but they did not find anything in their searches. Now, it's a very big lake, so that's not to say there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. Cindy gives them the name of another accomplice, Roy Yancey. She tells them that he knows about Marie Parker. Marie Parker was actually the girlfriend of Roy Yancey. But after she was kidnapped by David Ray, Yancey tells the police that Ray forced him to kill her. This was in 1997. He says that Roy held him at gunpoint and told Yancey to strangle her. He said that they together buried her in Monticello Canyon in the state park, but when he went to search with police they could not find her remains and he tells police he is pretty sure that ray went back after that and moved her body so that no one including roy would know where she was so i don't know anything else about marie parker like how she was abducted or like like i would like to assume that roy was not like involved in Mm -hmm. like getting her there but i don't in april of 1999 cindy agreed to testify against david parker ray in three separate trials those of kelly garrett cynthia vigil and angelica montano roy yancey had also agreed to testify in addition to the statements that he had already given police however David Ray seemed to be able to manipulate people in his favor, even from prison. Rumor is that Roy received a letter in prison that said, rats die in jail. But either way, Yancey decided not to testify and pled guilty to second degree murder. Around this time, Cindy also changed her mind about testifying. She withdrew her plea, says that she was lying in her past confessions, and is sentenced to 36 years in prison. Kelly Garrett's case was in July of 2000, where the defense, as you might suspect, claimed that the encounter was consensual. The introductory voice recording that David played to his captives was actually ruled inadmissible in the trial which I think might have made a difference in proving consent or not. They were able to use the video which shows Kelly Garrett's leg and her distinct tattoo, but she's not being injured in the video. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the defense presents is that she's there consensually, maybe she's even being recorded consensually, and that she's just like into the same things they're into. The jury was deadlocked in the case, and it was declared a mistrial. The retrial of that and of Cynthia Vigil were set for 2001, and they were moved to a different town. Cynthia Vigil and Kelly Garrett testified. Kelly actually stated she did not want David Ray to receive the death penalty, as she felt that that would be too easy. She preferred he spend the remainder of his life in prison. 
Unfortunately, Angie Montano had died from a fatal drug overdose before she could testify. However, despite that, Ray was found guilty of his crimes against Montano, which I find very interesting. I don't know how they did that, but good, great. The defense also offered a plea deal in exchange. They, like, David Ray agreed to offer, or whatever, to plea in exchange for Mm -hmm. the release of his daughter, Jessie Ray. He admitted to the crimes that he was charged with, and he was sentenced to 224 years in prison. Which is, like, so crazy to think, like, you wouldn't just say, like, life. But, like, he's not being well, I charged. I when, when they say that. Yeah. But it's, like, like, you're going to be in prison for 500 years. I'm like, yeah. okay. And it's, like, he's not being charged with actually, like, a capital crime. He's not being charged with murder. Yeah. He's just being charged with lots of other crimes. So they just add up. Yeah. It just, I think it's, um, it's, like, a flair for the dramatic. Yeah. Like, you're going to be here for 200 years. Yeah. I also think it's so, like, I mean, I guess this, like, shows us a little more about his relationship with Jesse. But mm-hmm. first, apparently he has another child that I've just, like, never even heard of. Can't even find their name. So maybe it's a boy and, like, that's why it's, like, irrelevant to him. But it's, like, he's, like, totally cool with Cindy going to prison. Mm-hmm. But it's, like, he's willing to go to prison. He's, like, sending notes as, like, death threats don't tell anyone what I did. So Roy and Cindy send their se- send themselves to prison. And then he just mm-hmm. goes like, I'm going to say what I did anyway because I want my daughter to be free. And it's like, that yeah. sucks, dude. Like, like are, you're a good dad? Yeah, like you didn't care about okay. Cindy at all. Great. So you, the- you found one person in this world that you enjoy? Yeah. So the police continued to try to search for any new evidence. At this point, they believed that David Ray could have murdered anywhere between 30 and 60 women. But they were unable to find any bodies nearby or link any additional crimes to David Ray. In May of 2002, they thought that they might catch a break when Ray contacted them saying that he was ready to talk. Ray was taken to Lee County Correctional in another part of New Mexico to be questioned, but on May 28th, before that interview, and less than a year into his 224-year sentence, David Parker Ray died of a random and massive heart attack. And that's the end. Do you know what, like, made them think that there were so many murder victims without... Like, was it just based on, like, Cindy saying, like, he had killed 14 people within eight months? Like, they're just, like, doing the math? No, it's the journals. It's, like, the videos and audio tapes. I mean... Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe that just means there's 30, they found 30 to 60, like, victims at all, and they're thinking, like, some of them Mm -hmm. had to have died, but I think there were just, like, so many different, like, writings about dozens and dozens of victims, and then videos about dozens and dozens of others, and, like, surely he's killing some of them, so, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I don't know where they get that number specifically, But Mm -hmm. I do think they found, which is, like, so hard to me that, like, you can find evidence where someone is committing to a crime, but if there is not a victim, you cannot charge them. Because, like, to me, David Ray should be charged with dozens of torture charges. Yeah. Whether we know who he tortured or not, like, he did, and he, like, admits to that. So... Mm -hmm. I think, but then it's, like, hard, because, like, what if someone's just being creative, just, like, writing a story, like, but if it's not real, but it obviously is, so it's, like, I don't know, I, I think it's, like, so hard until they can find bodies, or, and I, even then, like, if you start finding bodies in the state park, is there anything you can do other than say, like, we think this might be a victim of David Ray? 
I mean, right. yeah. But so I was very unsure about doing this case in general. Mm-hmm. But once I started to read on the survivors and like especially that Garrett, that Kelly Garrett didn't even like know. Um, mm-hmm. It just made me realize like there are other survivors and almost certainly victims who have like not received any kind of justice or mm-hmm. any sort of clarity. Um, and so I do think that like in a lot of ways this is like an ongoing case because like these are young like they these are not like mm-hmm. old women now like they're they would still I don't know want to know what happened to them I would think but I will include in the show notes Cynthia Behill has a website um, where she talks a little about how hard things have been for her. She's lived in different, like, motels over time and has, like, struggled with her finances. And she does have, like, a GoFundMe to help her purchase a home. So I will put Mm -hmm. that in there for her. Anything else? Sad. (laughs) I know it's like so weird because it's like I'm basically just telling a story of survivors Mm -hmm. and then like Marie Parker, but it's like a story of survivors, but it's also like, and probably a bunch of murder victims. Yeah. I know, and it's like he's called the toy box killer, but like I didn't really get to tell you anyone that he killed. Yeah, no confirm. Yeah. The suspected toy box killer. Yeah. That's our title right there. Okay. Well, we'll be here next week, folks. Yeah. Bye. Bye.